we're on. What's up and welcome to Conjure Community. I'm Aaron Fisher and I'm here today with Alex Slemmer from Conjure Community Club. That's the world's best magic club. Today, we're despite the picture of Tom Mullica that's uh, up on my left shoulder like a little angel, today we're going to be looking at the magic of Eugene Berger, of Eugene Berger, the late great uh, sainted Eugene Berger. So do us a quick favor, hit the like button and subscribe so you'll be notified every time we go live with one of these groovy new videos. Hello, sir. Hello. So today Alex. we're going to look at Eugene Berger. And this is really our, it's our third look at Eugene Berger. The first two, we sort of, we moved through the earlier stages of Eugene, moved to, you know, a more developed Eugene. And then today we're going to look at the close-up magic and really the great, ma in my opinion, the best magic of Eugene's. I love all the close-up stuff. Uh, we did a little bit of the stage stuff in the last one, or we looked at a stage piece in the last one. Uh, but in this one, it's all close-up magic and table-side magic, and you'll get a real good look at what it was like to be with Eugene Berger uh, when he was performing basically table-side. Because uh, you remember in the last couple of episodes, we were looking at Eugene uh, at the restaurant that he worked. We mentioned that he worked in the lounge mm -hmm. in the downstairs area. He also worked table side, but it was a very specific manner that he used to go about this thing. He would be invited. He would have a maitre d', he would have the waiter basically ask a group of people or they would request Eugene so that when dessert was dropped, Eugene would be invited, they'd bring a chair and Eugene would sit down and join the people, which is pretty wonderful. I, I just got to tell y'all, hearing Alex say that really takes me back to when I was hearing that this was an opportunity, a choice when I was a teenager. And I never considered such a thing, right? We were we thought that as a strolling uh, artist, you're some lower form of life, and this is the way it is. And then re reading when Eugene was talking about that, I first went, uh, no, that's not possible. And then, of course, I realized it's not possible to work without it. Not really. Like once you go, once came, you take Eugene's advice, you don't want to go back. And it came out of a real world situation where he said, I'm never going to have this happen again. Right. He was working behind the bar. Everything's going great. Everyone's laughing. All the jokes are hitting. All the tricks are hitting. It's all it's working. And then, you know, he moved down the bar and he started doing magic for this couple that was sitting there. And he got like maybe a couple sentence in, sentences into his presentation. And the, this guy looks up at Eugene and just says uh, to me. We were having a conversation. <laughs> she just said, ouch, that hurt me. I wanted to, I wanted to push a button and make myself disappear. I didn't want to be there. I felt horrible. I just stepped on these people's evening and I don't, I don't ever, ever, ever want that to happen again. And that's when he figured out this gambit that is a great way to go about it. Be invited everywhere you go. <laughs> you know, What's beautiful about it is that one piece of advice, I think, did more for generations of close up workers to help them understand how the effect is really created. Because, you know, questions like how an audience pays you or a client pays you and what they expect from you and how they treat you all have an awful lot to do with how the audience perceives you. And what you begin to realize when you're a younger performer and you hear Eugene saying this, you go, well, I'm not going to be able to get them to do that. I'm not going to be able to get them to invite me. I'm not going to be able to get them to let me sit. All these kinds of questions, you begin to realize that it's too late with these clients. You have essentially started by creating and setting up the whole situation against your advantage from the very beginning so that by the time it's all pre-established. And so I just remember in my desire to learn to live what Eugene's advice was, I had to change how I handled every aspect of talking to clients, booking the show, everything in order to get to that one thing. So it's this instance where this one piece of advice has so much wisdom packed into it. It's sort of like Erdnay's in that way. It's like, how can one line have the whole world in it? Well, BJ, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Eugene only being invited to perform and insisting on it there's an awful lot of things you got to insist on and make happen in order for that to be just the natural. Uh, and it's, it becomes a completely different relationship with the venue that you're working, right. With all the people that are there. I've noticed when I, because I, you know, when I heard that, I was like, well, why would you do it any other way? 
And when I work restaurants, I have the wait staff grab me and introduce me at tables. And I'm standing. I don't I don't join them seated. I'm happy to stand. But I have the wait staff is very in tune with what their folks want and what I want. And it's a party, you know. I end up doing magic for them as much as I'm doing magic for all of the people that are at the restaurant eating because they are requesting the days to come and hang out when the magic guy's there because it's all of us in it together and it becomes a whole thing. You know, I, I'm, I'm happy to split my tips with everybody. I'm happy to just make it so it just seems like we're all in it together so we can just make sure everybody sees good magic. You know, it's really the and goal. So, and it, it changed everything. And you're talking everything. now about, about being generous with your fellow wait staff and the people that decide whether or not, you know, you're on their turf. And either they're happy right. to see you and, and they look at you as a person who helps them and contributes to their life or they look at you as another obstacle in their very busy job. So, And you're an and, adversary. And, That's right. and again, if you've gotten yourself in a situation where the 20 bucks seems the, the, the gratuities, the $20 gratuity that you may have, you know, if it seems to you that you, perhaps that's so important that you should consider at least sharing that with your wait staff. I think uh, that's got to be reconsidered. That's just another thing. You know I mean, because you're like that person. I remember once I worked at a McDonald's for like four days and the problem came because I didn't go back to work uh, for two more days. I was off work for two days and that was long enough, you know, long enough to think about it and go on. No, it was long enough in that environment. <laughs> me to, become an, uh, to me for me to be easy to to politic against so what i'm suggesting is gotcha. is that you couldn't yeah. be any more of an outsider at a restaurant you show up for one night mm -hmm. maybe you'll be back next week on the same night but everyone who's there every day with the manager on tuesday night on wednesday night if you just aren't great there's gonna be and there's a good reason for people to want to get rid of you they're going to try and get rid of you. They're going to tell their boss everything they can think of. It's best for you to really consider everyone there to be your essential partner for life. Let's get into you. We can into talk you. about this all day. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, we could talk about this stuff all day. Totally. So let's. Uh, and hello again to you all. Take a look at this. That's this is. Um, this is Eugene. Again, joining table side, well, right? I'm going so to let's, show you uh, let's take a look. Really quite amazing. Suzanne, let me ask you, do you play cards? Not very often. Perfect. I hate it when they play cards. <laughs> Here's what we'll do, Suzanne. I will deal the cards one at a time slowly. And on impulse, you tell me when to stop. And you can play as hard to get as you want. And she is. <laughs> Look at the card, show it to everyone. Now, if I took your card, which golly, I just did, <laughs> and if I put it on top of the deck, you would know exactly where it is. Yeah. <laughs> if I put it on the bottom, you'd also know, but when I cut the cards, it goes in the center. But the spirits know. Do you believe in spirits? Yes. Good, because I hate doing this with agnostics. <laughs> spirits? Show us Suzanne's card now. Tell them to go back. Go back. Suzanne, you take the card. You take the whole deck. And at these prices, it's always the right card. Show them. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Alex, I want to ask you a question because I know that you're uh, an expert on a lot of ways of doing haunted pack animations. And, you know, I know you authored our conjured mm -hmm. training on animations and levitations uh, using modern methods. Now, Eugene's not using yeah. a terribly modern method. He's using a pretty neoclassical method that, you know, he put in print probably by the end of the 80s or the early 90s at the latest. Uh, That's about right. Yep. And this was so magical and so beautiful and so robust an effect, right? How, it's hard for me to imagine that the ease and simplicity of modern methods get you all of what happened there. What's your, what's your take? The, the modern methods, 
um, definitely lets you feel more bulletproof in a lot of different ways. And Eugene's using a, like you said, it's a very old school method. If you're not handling it properly, you could get caught, right? And it, it's, it, I don't know if you know not, but he's doing that whole thing with the deck on the back of his hand. You're saying that alone and that's off, is hard. That alone is hard. So he's doing that along with a secret method and all these things are happening. There's a delicate little dance that's happening there. I spent a lot of time working on that one and is it, it is its own beast. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's the wrong one. You know, it just is the one that I, it's not the one that I gravitated towards, but I think it's my own, awesome. My, my own question to you is, yeah. Yeah. I know it's difficult. I know that it's difficult mm -hmm. for reasons that aren't technique, right? It's thing you got to mm -hmm. make sure it looks right and all this kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. there's that's right. similar difficulties within modern methods because they're all based on, it, they couldn't be as di any different applications of the same and, and still be called the same principle if they're still the same principle but my question to you is is there something yeah. if that you would have to say legitimately can be gotten with eugene's approach that can't be done really that loses a little something from the modern approach the thing about the thing about eugene's is that if your technique is true it won't ever fail unless the cards fall off your hand, right? I right. mean, it, it will work every single time and you can't- More than the- is it, is it too bold to say? More than- the, you, you can't break it. Right, more than the loopy method <laughs> that people crazy- That's right. Right. And those, those are all very, you have to have the touch. You have to be able to work with a very light touch or things break down on you. With that one, it, you, you can't break it. Right. And <laughs> so in that sense, it's a bulletproof method but in terms of the actual look of the effect. Mm -hmm. I always get the impression that the classical effect maybe has an, a hair of added mystery to it in the in the actual floating. Do you think that's not true? The Well, if you go back to the original method and you go like Al Baker, you know, he has he's going for as much mist can like one of the best ways that I know of Al Baker doing it is saying, all right, everybody, let's clear out, sitting in the living room, move the coffee table, let's move these chairs back, give me the cards, I'm gonna get down on the floor. And he spreads the cards out, has the, you know, the cards selected, put back, he puts it down, he gets back a, a few feet, starts waving his hands, and the thing cuts itself on the floor. And there's nothing to find, he doesn't even touch the cards again, one card sticking out, it's the selection, you know, Al Baker was going for as much mystery as he could. And Eugene is very much in the vein of Al Baker. And he's trying to make that mysterious thing that was, that I just said happen there. Right. And obviously, as you saw, it's very successful. Yeah. My only, my only question is, is does going his old school method get you a little bit more mystery in the floating or not really, do you feel like in the end? Or the trade-offs not really related. I think at the end of the day, they're probably very similar in terms of how it's moving. But again, like I said, Eugene's is bulletproof. It's it's like it's like got a big metal shell around it, and the thing can't break. So that old method, <laughs> despite the fact that you got to watch where everyone is and make sure it's right, actually is more durable mm -hmm. and less prone to problems in the final analysis. You set up you set up once for it in the night and you could probably literally do it for like eight hours straight before you feel like you need to refresh anything. Refresh you know what I mean? Yeah, it's so beautiful. I mean, everything with Eugene right up to and including the way he's got what appears to be a lovely piece of cloth that matches his waistcoat. You know, it, yeah. in that beautiful small frame, it just looks beautiful, you know? Just looks beautiful and he's so charming uh anything else you want and, and another note on that yeah one other note on that trick is that it's versatile too right you would assume that he could only do that seated at a table he can do that walk around surround it mm -hmm. so it's a powerful that's a powerful tool that whole that whole routine is a powerful tool you can set the stage in a way that uh you can't otherwise because you know you have to be pretty skilled if you're using that other method we were talking about because you have to you need you need a place to put those cards and make them move are you going to do that on someone's hand? Ooh, that's a pretty big challenge. And by him doing it all one-handed on the back of his hand, he cleans up all the problems. You know, for walk around, it's beautiful. It's like old uh, Erdnays used to say, right? Uh, if uh, feats of uh, card handling 
could be had for the asking. There would be little in them to profit anyone. And I think when you get dealing with things that are floating, all the floating stuff works probably how people guess. That's the other thing about flotations and animations. If you just had to guess when you watch a magic show, your first guess isn't too far off. So whenever your first guess isn't too far off, the amount of artistry required to bring that method home to its full potential is I think pretty significant, right? Because it is work how people think it works. But by the time Eugene finishes that trick, there's no way anyone could possibly think. They just think, oh, it's probably, you know, it's it's not magnets either, you know? There, there's no way of, of investing in your sensible idea because it looks so much like magic. Right. So, that Lauren, that's called the- and, that, and that's the idea. That's called the haunted pack. Yeah, haunted pack. And in fact, which of Eugene's uh, books is the best source for it? I'm pretty sure Spirit Theater, that's like the highlight of that book is that he has the, the haunted pack in Spirit Theater, that specific handling. I love uh, it. And it's pretty wonderful and other, yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty pretty great. What was the other thing? So let's move on to another one. I didn't, this is I, another one that's a big shit. I didn't mean to give you the old uh, snip snip if you had wanted to say something. No, no, it's good. We 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 said a lot about the haunted pack, and, and rightly so because it's a killer trick, killer trick. I every time I do close up magic, some form or another, I'm doing I'm doing the haunted pack. That animation is a uh, really tough to beat. And Eugene, when he did it in this setting, he opened with it, <laughs> which is pretty interesting. I generally save that as a closer because it, to me, it seems like you can't do much more after you move the cards. It's I feel like it's the Vernon much more play. impressive. You know? it's, it's the straight Vernon close-up room play. It's the cups and balls opener play, right? Right. It's counter program, right? right? Exactly. It's anything you picture Caps or Vernon doing, which is you, you take, what's the big closer? Let's open with that, you know? Uh, and that's the kind of thing that only only the, the Titans we've mentioned or possibly Jerry Garcia would do. So, uh, bold choice. It's a beautiful thing. What I love about that, of course, is it forces you to counter-program your climax as well. If you're gonna start with a closer, it's your ending can be pure impact, but likely it's gonna have to come around and hit you sideways. You know what I mean? Uh, you're, you're, not, you're not gonna be able to solve that problem the same way. Once you start with a miracle, you know what I mean? <laughs> we can debate the relative miraculousness of David Copperfield appearing in a uh, elevator. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. But it's not- It's a pretty great trick though. It's a great trick, but it's not the haunted deck of stage magic. See, stage magic relative to- It's not the haunted deck. The other, relative to card magic, close-up card and coin magic, a haunted deck is about as close to a full-blooded illusion as you're ever going to see, right? Agreed. Agree with that. Totally. All right, let's do the next one. Well, let's move on to this. This, this is a classic amongst close-up folks. This is a, a classic of Matt Shulian's. And this is really great because you don't ever see anybody Show do this thing one. and you join the, the master. Uh, you take the whole deck of cards if you want, spread the cards so the faces are toward you, and take out not a picture card, take out a number card, take it right out of the deck. I'll take the deck, you keep the card, and on this side of your card, make a little picture, but it doesn't have to be anything like the Chicago skyline and my new detail or anything of that sort. Okay. <laughs> I'll take the pen, show them the card, and then I'll put it back. I can do this, believe it or not, two ways. You too. <laughs> About 30% of the time, I do it by reading Mary's mind. But I only tell the good thing. And the rest of the time, I cheat. Let's go psychic. My psychic feeling, did you see the card? Okay. It was red and it was a diamond. Is that correct? Bummer. On to cheating. 
Now, you give the deck a <laughs> shuffle, and don't feel self-conscious that they're all evaluating your shuffling ability. I'm not. <laughs> I'm just going to do it like this then, because I'm... I'll take the deck. Now, answer honestly, is that your card? No. You see, sometimes people actually shuffle their cards to the bottom, mm -hmm. and that's pretty impressive. What, I, what I'll do is uh, hit the deck with the spoon. And when I do that, your card will actually go to the bottom of the deck, even though the spoons here, <coughs> just to see if you were watching, are kind of strange. Now, you probably say to yourself, well, yes, but my card is already on the bottom of the deck, but the truth is, it isn't. No. Name the card out loud. Five to six. Pretty amazing. <laughs> and there it is, wonder of wonders no. on the... Was the card? Oh, do you know what happened? I hit it too hard. Look, it went right through the tablecloth. Oh. <laughs> oh. oh. Margie, would you reach under the tablecloth, get Mary's card, and pass it back to make sure that Mary's name is still on it? My picture. Gets me every time. It's the one. Oh. Dude. How long was that? Dude. Huh? How long was that trick? A minute and a half? Two and a half minutes. <laughs> One of those most perfect tricks. You know, when you read that Shulian stuff, it yeah. When you're a kid, okay. When I say when you're a kid, it, it substitute wherever you are in magic if you're just encountering this stuff for the first time. Uh when I say I'm a kid or with kids, I mean when I was a kid, this is what happened to me. Um, you know, here comes Kelly is in the Shulian's book. That's the one where, you know, card under glass, right? But, but in here comes Kelly, you, you, I believe you waterfall the cards down over the glass and it's a rocks glass. And the selection is seen bent around the inside of the rocks glass when that's done. Okay. So you've got these card discoveries of Shulian, right? Uh, and this is, and you know, inside a matchbook. Uh, and this is, of course, another A number one example because what a penetration, right? I mean, you've got a signed card penetrating a tablecloth in this incredibly beautiful, incredible, uh, lovely way, right? When you're a kid and someone first, if you're interested in sleight of hand, you first get beaten by like a card under glass. That's a painful, exciting experience. And the idea of being able to steal a card out of the deck, you know what I mean? And while everyone doesn't know you have, and they're watching the trick, you know, and you getting to the point where you say, your card is under the glass. And I go, it feels like if you can accomplish that, you're going to be the happiest magician in the history of the world. Because <laughs> your audience right. is going to be so happy. It's going to be the best thing ever. And then, and of course you can't do it. And you're very painfully aware that you're not able to do it. And you're very slowly month by month coming to terms with the fact that when people say it's going to be years of practice, they mean that literally. And it's hard for you to even put that in your mind that you could actually, but you're starting to realize that since you can do so little of this and you clearly want to do it and it clearly can be done, it's going to literally take you years to be able to do this. And then you see stuff like this <laughs> and here comes Kelly and you can't do that stuff either. It's just like, it's imagine, imagine going to the dim sum restaurant and they bring out the best, most incredible egg roll. And you feel like one day I'll be able to afford this egg roll, but <laughs> some restaurant. So then at the same time, they wheel out these other Matt Julian card discoveries and each one is like the first one, but better. And they all require this entire relationship with cards and the people and magic that nothing like what you've got developed so far. And it's when you begin to realize that in order to do this magic, your entire relationship with magic, the audience, the cards themselves is going to have to change enough to be considered an evolution to another thing entirely. That's right. It's some of the hardest stuff ever because it's what you had. I mean, you have to be in tune with them so much that they're looking everywhere they're supposed to look at all moments so that when you have to get that secret moment, it just goes completely unnoticed. Otherwise, the game is up. 
And uh, it's very interesting to study all that Shulian stuff. That whole book is full of just, you know, most groundbreaking material, the most direct lines to the method, right? The most direct line to getting the stuff done so that you can focus on just being present and performing. It's wonderful, wonderful. And I think it's part, it should be a part of everyone's education and magic. Matt Shulian is an important player in the close-up world. Except the problem is, and this is, you know, we don't talk about 3M that often, but it, it bears discussion in a situation like this. Because if you read the Matt Shulian book, it's all very clearly described. He tells you, like Alex says, it's the direct method. Technique, he tells you what you need. <laughs> tells you exactly what to do and when to do it. It's totally great. My point, though, is when he says, for example, look up at the audience, you know, as they're shuffling the cards and doing this, and this moment happens and that moment happens, and you lift this up and you toss that in there and no one sees it, that is a full-blooded misdirective play. If you are super comfortable, if you live and breathe and think in misdirection like a magician who is, call it certified, right? Then it's, then it's an easy, mm -hmm. simple method. But, Agreed. but it takes for granted the fact that the only people reading it are people who can do it already or their kids who can't get there from here. One of the things that made the 3M class uh, makes it so useful and wonderful for people is that for the first time it starts to give them access to the levers of attention management that eventually make it so that it's easy for you to say hey you do that and you know you look over there oh look at that the tie's under my tie you know all that stuff has to happen in a moment it has to happen without fear without god you know it just has to happen instantly without thinking about it and it really means you got to speak misdirection to do it. You have to be living and breathing in a world where the cards are not in the center of your world. The, the audience and the dynamic between them has got to be where your energy is in order for something like that. And then, of course, the wild thing is, it's a and that's, thing to do once you have those skills. And that's like the opposite of what you're, what you're led to when you first get into magic is, just, is that you, well, I just need them to look away when I do this secret thing. And you realize the deeper you get into magic, it's controlling every single moment so that when you do the secret thing, you have control over that one too. And that's, yeah. that's a different ball of wax. What do we always say? I always said, and as we talk about this in 3M, that you start by trying to make people look away at the secret moment. And I remember, and I write this right. next class, right? Because I'd be like, okay, now I'm supposed to look up. <laughs> They're going to look up. And when they look, mm -hmm. all right, are you ready? They'd be like, I'm ready. And be like, you ready? <laughs> no one would ever like, it was very obvious what I was trying. What's to the do. phrase? That dog won't hunt. <laughs> dog wouldn't hunt. And that's when I began to slowly realize that it only works if you normally are moving at a normal pace. You focus on this and you focus on that. You focus on this. You focus on that. And then you can start to build that thing together. And once you can start to do that, what's beautiful about a trick like this, and this is so important, and we talk about this in 3M again, and the reason I think it's so useful is that you never hear it talked about this way. And when you do talk, I mean, you can ask Brian Farley or any of the folks here. Uh, it, it's a real helpful thing to do to separate out structural misdirection the way Eugene has it built and Shulian has it built so that the when the audience is shuffling the cards, there's structure there. There's a lot of action that's happening apart from what you're doing with your eyes that is moving the audience where you want it to be. Right. So for most of us, we're really good when all the misdirection is required is structural. Right. Where we start to have trouble with a lot of these things, and this is how it is with all of the tricks in this class we're talking about, is where you have the combination of structural and what we call attention jacking, moment to moment gaze control by moving your energy in the five points of magic from, from the moment before moments before up to during and away from in the same kind of unbroken pattern of moving around so so once you've got that stuff going that's the language of magic and it's a heck of a uh, versatile language to speak in um 
And so for those of you who are interested in this kind of stuff, I would say the first thing to do is really even more than the slides, right? Is to start learning how, how the misdirection exercises work in real life, you know? Uh, and if you need an angle on that, that you can get into right away, try and find one of my blue Ray crossing the cut, uh, blogs or something where we talk about it for, for many minutes and take 3M when we do it again. So I think it's going to be a nice big, big crowd when we do it again, because we missed it last fall. Uh, it's hard right. not to, it's hard to, have to talk about that stuff because I just remember Alex, that these were the card tricks I wanted to do. And they were the cards right. that were so clearly not there was a big skill required and it wasn't palming the card, especially this one. Cause as I recall this one, it's more like, you know, you know, that's right. Just, I don't even think, he, I don't think he palms it. I think he might even just drop it. Yeah. I think, <laughs> I, I recall, he lifts the thing and throws it. Right. But the key is, is you've got to have such confidence in your misdirection that it wouldn't have mattered if you palmed it. It wouldn't have mattered what you did with it. The key was right. at that moment in that exact moment, there was no energy. Uh, there was no heat. Yeah, and no memory of it yeah. that it ever happened. You know? That's right. That's right. That's a video we may watch again sometime. Yeah, it, that's a good one. It's a good one. Look how good. Well, let's, um, get people let's get to the next one here. I would love to hear that. I would love to hear that. Eugene uh, Newell, sorry, is right. And I, I kind of, incidentally, Alex, when the trick ended, I wanted to ask you to yeah. replay the whole trick, but it seemed rude. I would like to know, can we rewind it to the moment when Eugene asks the folks to shuffle? Maybe a few moments before. Is that too much of an ask? Uh, let me let me say this before we do that. This is edited. So it's not you're not going to see what you're looking for. Oh, it's that part's not there. Not even the line? Not No, not in the way that you're hoping for. No, no. I just want to hear the line. But if you're saying it's not gonna, oh, you'll get the line, but that, but there's nothing, there's nothing to see, is my point. Well, that's okay. There's nothing but, to see. But will we be able to know the pattern of how it's happening when we hear that? Because that's all I want. I don't listen. Uh, maybe. Do we want to go down that road yeah. here? <laughs> we don't have to. Okay. Uh, I'll leave it up to you if you're having a, a corporate giving you the decision desk that we are straying from our remit in talking deeply about the moments i'm i support you yeah i would i would prefer to do that in the after show why don't we do that there all we'll right save it for there well then let's do one more piece and then we'll head to the it after. doesn't seem wise to let everybody come into our magic club and see you know the inner workings of friends, everything friends, unless they join the club if you happen to be watching this and you're not in the magic club uh know this after the show we pulled down the pants of ourselves and the whole trick metaphorically speaking uh, but to the purpose of teaching a very esoteric idea. Uh, and it's an important thing to note for all of you watching, no matter where you're watching, that the beauty about the things we're talking about is there's not a chance in hell you could hear a discussion and even see what's happening in this trick and then be it a magician that same day and know when a similar setup is being used on you. You'll never spot it in a billion years. That's why it's worth learning. Uh, what's our last piece here, Alex? True. All right, let's uh, let, let me pick the best of what we got here. This is one of my favorite Eugene Berger tricks here. Uh, we, if we're gonna do one more, let's do this. This is great. This, well, I'm, I'm not even gonna say anything. I'm just gonna let the thing speak for itself because I think it does. Well, this let's is do a hard one, Barbara. Okay, hold your left hand palm upward. I'm going to send Barbara a thought. Now, Barbara, to receive a thought requires a lot of imagination, but I know already that you have a good one. So imagine this. Imagine that I could come over to the deck that you're holding, reach in, and remove all of the cards of one color. In your imagination, tell me, did I remove the red cards or the black one? Absolutely right. She's good. Now, that means if you're imagining you're holding a box that contains only black cards, spades and clubs, I want to use one of those seats. You were so good before, I'll send it to you mentally. 
Barbara, shall we use spades or clubs? Clubs. Right again. Good. She's good at this. Now, in a deck of cards, there are 13 different clubs. We'll speed this up a bit and eliminate half of them. Barbara, when I snap my fingers, you say high or low. High. High is eliminated. I think I love you. <laughs> There's the ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven of clubs. I'm going to send Barbara one of those cards, and she's going to get it. You know why I didn't pick you? Why? You're going to get the wrong card. <laughs> <laughs> How could, I, how could I know that? Oh. I'm a trained professional. <laughs> but see what card you got. Okay. And see what card you got. All right. Ready? Ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Barbara, what card did you get? Five. Five. Really? Oh. Knowing that she got the five, two, do you want to change your card? Sure. <laughs> There's always that percentage. Okay, ready? Ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What did you get that time? I got the seven of clubs. What did you get that time? I stuck with the five. You stuck with the five. Now, do you want to keep the seven or do you want to change it? It's up to you. I'll keep it. Let me ask you one more question. Is the seven of clubs, not spades, the clubs, your favorite card in the deck, or is it just another card you have? It's just another card. Believe it or not, Barbara, the Seven of Clubs is my favorite card in the deck. And not only that, it is the card I was mentally sending you the whole time out of all of these cards. And Barbara, you got it. Congratulations. It took you two times, but you got it. And you cynically don't believe me. I can prove it. See, my favorite card, the seven of clubs, the card I was sending Barbara, uh -huh. as a blue map. The back of every other card in the deck <laughs> is red. Barbara, uh, check them out. I'm so glad I didn't pick you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that presentation for that. He's just sending a thought. It's just an idea. I'm gonna I'm gonna plant this idea in your mind before we even start here. And everything is just up to that and, and playing, right? And then creating that huge conflict with you're gonna get it wrong. That's why I chose her. I I think it's one of the great presentations for that, even if you use the standard gaff that everyone knows to do something like that. But notice that when Eugene did that. All of those cards were placed into the hands of the spectators, and he had no care in the world when that occurred. Uh, it's pretty bulletproof. I think it's great. <laughs> I think it's one of the great Eugene Berger tricks. Absolutely wonderful. It's just wonderful. It's a perfect piece of magic, right? It's real close-up magic. Yeah, agreed. Well, that's it. Friends, That's it. thank you so much for coming. We're going to stick around for the after show. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, uh, like, hit the like button, let everybody know we're doing a good job with the videos, uh, subscribe to Conjure Community and get notified when we go live with new videos. And if you've never tried out an awesome magic club, good for you. There is one now. Check out our club, Conjure Community Club. So thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you on the next one. Now we're going to go talk about secrets with the members.